So I know some of us all feel like we could just wake up from this dream, man, and none of this would have ever happened. You know what I mean? I send prayers to everybody affected by this whole thing that's going on. This video here we're going to get into, man, is how satellite images reveal what's happening in Ukraine. All right. So if you knew, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and join the fam. And let's check this out. It's been nearly one year now since the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine and sparked the biggest war seen in Europe since 1945. Over the past 12 months of this raging conflict, Europe has experienced more historical tremors than it had in decades beforehand. The entire world order and the way of life for hundreds of millions of people have been shuffled around in unprecedented ways. And never before has such a major conflict in human history been so thoroughly documented by satellites above. Thousands of images of the war and its consequences have been taken by commercial satellites over these past 12 months. And compiling all of them together from beginning to the present illustrates in an unprecedented way how the past 12 months have changed Ukraine, Russia, and the rest of the world forever. Before the invasion even began, images captured by satellites were sending worrying signals that the Russians were actively plotting an invasion. Across 2021 and into early January of 2022, the Russian military began building up large numbers of troops and equipment all around their borders with Ukraine. For months, the Russians insisted that these buildups were merely routine military exercises. They insisted that the Russian military had every right to conduct exercises within their own territory, even if they were all simultaneously taking place all across their borders with Ukraine. But as time went on, the images the satellites were telling were putting the Russian narrative and intentions into question. These are photographs that were captured by satellites over Belarus, near to the Ukrainian border just days before the full-scale invasion began. The Russians had deployed around 30,000 of their troops in a Belarus. A I remember that, man. And they were saying, you know, nah, this isn't going to happen. I was watching C CNBC. I'm a I trade a lot. They trade a lot. So I was watching CNBC to see what was going on and if this was actually going to happen. And they kept saying, nah, this is not going to happen. This not going to happen. And then they kept saying, well, they keep deploying troops close to the borders, close to the borders. Nah, this is just a simulation. You kept hearing all different kinds of conflicting stories and stuff. And then when it started to happen, man, my heart just sank, man. I called my kids downstairs, the family down, and we sat down and we was watching the news. I remember that whole night, man. It was just tragic to just hear what was going on and, and to hear those explosions and different things, man. Like, that, it made the hair on the back of your neck stand up ostensibly for joint military exercises with the Belarusian armed forces. But three kinds of images began ringing alarm bells to many that an imminent invasion was coming. The first were images like this one, captured within Belarus near to the Ukrainian border, clearly showing more than 50 heavy equipment and troop transporters all lined up in a row ready to be deployed. The next were several photos like these in the days leading up to the invasion clearly showing dozens of idling Russian attack helicopters lined up in fields and across airstrips around the Belarusian town of Shozhniki, a mere 40 kilometers away from the Ukrainian border just across the Policy State Radiological Reserve. A large swath of enclosed territory in Belarus that was most heavily affected by the Chernobyl disaster's nuclear fallout. But by far the most alarming images to analysts right before the invasion were ones like these. This image was captured within Russia in the town of Krasnaya Yaruga, the day before the invasion took place, clearly showing a freshly deployed field hospital less than 10 kilometers away from the border with Ukraine. It was far from the only one. This was another image taken within the occupied Crimean Peninsula a couple weeks before the invasion, See, showing I never, troops- I never saw that. They never showed that. That's a field hospital, bro. They were prepared, prepared. See, when all those stories were floating around, we didn't get to see none of these images. So some of us were really under the assumption that, man, this is not about to happen. Tense an additional field hospital set up. Here's another image from right before the invasion, clearly showing the deployment of yet another field hospital More. by the Russians in the town of Narulia in southern Belarus, less than 30 kilometers away from the Ukrainian border. If the Russians were only carrying out routine military exercises like they claimed, then why were they constructing so many field hospitals to care for a large amount of wounded soldiers at several different points along the border with Ukraine? The answer, of course, was because they were planning on using those field hospitals to support their invasion that would come in the next few days. 
On the 24th of February in 2022, nearly 200,000 Russian soldiers from all around Ukraine's borders were finally given the order to attack. One of the very first objectives of their invasion was to quickly send helicopters and airborne troops from Belarus to capture the Antonov airport within the city of Hostomel, a suburb of the capital city, Kyiv. The airport was only located about 10 kilometers outside of the city center in Kyiv, implying that if the Russians could capture it, they could use it to airlift in more troops and heavy equipment to put pressure on the Ukrainian capital. Recognizing the airport's strategic value, the Ukrainian military immediately responded to the Russian presence and the battle that was fought over its control was fierce. Revealed in satellite images like these that show the extensive damage caused to hangars, planes, and the runway itself. Even though the Russians successfully captured it after a few days, the heavy fighting over the airport damaged it too extensively to be effectively used to fly in more troops. So without being able to use the airport, the Russians began piling their troops and equipment into trucks instead and concentrated them into huge columns that they threw down the Ukrainian road system towards Kyiv. Hundreds of satellite images captured the long convoys of Russian trucks crowded on the highways like these, slowly but surely barreling down from Belarus towards the Ukrainian capital. They had to do it this way because the Russians decided to invade the country at the end of February leading into March and the spring season, precisely the time when the snow in Ukraine is melting and rainfall begins to pick up which turns large swaths of the countryside and unpaved roads into effectively impassable, deep, muddy quagmires. This is the very same problem that the Germans encountered when they invaded through this exact same area 80 years ago during the invasion of the Soviet Union. Russia's heavy tanks and trucks quickly found themselves bogged down in the mud and stranded when they attempted to cross over the muddy fields, and that effectively limited them to bunching up together onto major paved roads within Ukraine instead. At one point, a nearly continuous convoy of Russian military vehicles consisting of around 15,000 Russian troops spanned for more than 60 kilometers between these two cities as it approached Kyiv. But concentrating onto paved roads like this made them easy targets to Ukrainian drones and partisans, because their movements were predictable and their locations were easy to spot. The 60-kilometer convoy of trucks and tanks barreling towards Kyiv quickly stalled out in a traffic jam of their own making. Running low on fuel and food and beset by poor maintenance conditions and attacks from Ukrainian drones and partisans, they never made it to attack the capital and would eventually withdraw completely by the beginning of April. In the opening days of the war, millions of Ukrainian civilians decided to flee from the violence and escape towards safety in the European Union. This image was captured by a satellite just four days after the invasion began at a major border crossing between Ukraine and Hungary, showing a long queue of cars from the Ukrainian side all lined up to cross into Hungary. Dang. As the Russian military convoy inched ever closer to Kyiv across March, more and more civilians decided to leave people, from the bro. city. As captured in this picture just of- Just imagine what they were thinking, what they were going through, having to leave behind your home, not knowing what you're gonna come back to. Now the in the mental in aspect of the impacts that this is gonna have on them the rest of their lives. This is gonna be crazy, man. It's gonna have long lasting effects. Over Kyiv on the 10th of March, showing a long traffic jam of cars all trying to leave from the capital at the same time. But the gears of history weren't making it easy for everyone in the country to escape. In the city of Irpin, another suburb just to the west of Kyiv, a crucial bridge over the Irpin River was deliberately self-destroyed by the Ukrainian military in order to slow down the Russian advance on Kyiv. Captured here in this satellite image, with dozens of cars stuck on the other side of it with no ability to cross. Today, one year into the invasion, around 8 million Ukrainian civilians, 90% of whom are women and children, have left the country and become refugees across Europe representing nearly one in every five Ukrainians before the start of the war. This represents not only the largest refugee crisis seen in Europe since the Second World War, but the largest refugee crisis seen anywhere in the world in the 21st century. And from all across Ukraine, the satellite images captured between March and June were showing very clearly what it was they were attempting to escape from. This is an image that was captured four days into the invasion in a residential area just outside of the Antonov airport in a suburb of Kyiv whose name would later become infamous around the world. Bucha. People's homes are already destroyed and burnt out military vehicles can be clearly seen littering the streets. 
A few days later, just to the north of where that image was taken, this photo was captured showing armored vehicles advancing through the snow, while this image was captured of artillery pieces in the middle of firing their shells. Less than 8 kilometers away from where these artillery pieces were firing is the Ukrainian town of Moschun, where this satellite image captured on the same day shows homes destroyed and actively on fire. Further to the north of Kyiv in the Ukrainian town of Chernev, a shocking satellite photo reveals a large crater in the middle of an Olympic sports stadium in a residential area, the direct result of a Russian artillery shell. The city of Chernev exists almost immediately across the border of Belarus, and is the most major city between Belarus and the Ukrainian capital in Kyiv. As a result, it was almost immediately put to siege by the invading Russian forces, and by the 10th of March, was already almost completely encircled. That same day on the 10th, a satellite above captured this before and after photo of a shopping center in Chernev that became a casualty of the fighting. Its roof completely burned away to nothing. But Chernihiv and Kyiv were far from the only cities and locations the Russians were attacking. Complementing Russia's ground assaults was an air campaign of missiles targeting critical Ukrainian infrastructure, like this fuel storage depot in the town of Kalinivka, more than a hundred miles behind the front lines near Kyiv. On the 25th of March, a oh. missile struck this depot and destroyed it, revealed in these images taken before and after the attack. In their drive to capture the Ukrainian capital and overthrow the government, the Russian armed forces attempted to make a blitzkrieg-style attack against it from here just to the west of Belgorod. Their plan was to try and rapidly advance across hundreds of kilometers in order to open up another front to the east of Kyiv, adding further pressures to the city and complementing their already existing front in the north. But in order to get there, they had to get through the city of Sumy first which immediately became the site of another ferocious urban battle. This image taken by a satellite shows a quiet set of apartment buildings in a church in Sumi back in the summer of 2021, months before the invasion began. And then this image was taken in March of 2022 in exactly the same location. The church is now destroyed, while the apartment buildings show clear signs of damage from the battle being fought over the city's control. And this location is far from the only place in Sumi to see such devastation. In another part of the city before the invasion, we see a street intersection, residential homes, and other buildings. And then, after the invasion, nearly everything in that original photo is in complete ruins. It's difficult to find a single building here between these photos that escaped the Battle of Sumi unscathed. A harrowing difference of only a few months in time. But perhaps scary part of this bro is this could easily be us this could be us we we got our issues right now back and forth with china this could this could be us and i know everybody likes to say well they don't want none of us and this that and the third it's not even about that it's about you know what i mean what getting it getting into it with someone or another country or whatever what, it, what type of damage can be done. We may come out in the end victorious, but what are we losing while doing that? You know what I'm saying? He's like, like, this is heartbreaking, bro, to see these houses and these homes and these churches and these fields and these different things destroyed. Bro, I'm, I'm coming at you from a, a person who's, like I told y'all my background, right? So I would see a lot of people's houses burned down. You know what it's like to consult, try to console somebody who's watching everything they built from the ground up, just gone in a blink of an eye. If you've been through that, then you understand what I'm saying right now. If you've never been through that, bro, it's something that you don't want to experience. And this is kind of similar to that. Everything that these people have worked for their entire lives. Gone. Perhaps the most shocking contrast that the satellites captured over Sumi was this one. The first is an image over the central part of the city and the local train station back in 2021, when life was normal. And the second is an image over the oh same location gosh. just days after the city became surrounded by Russian troops several months later. In the second image, improvised tents distributing supplies to a crowd of hundreds of people now living under siege can be clearly seen. 
while many of the previous buildings around the square and the train station are now destroyed. Clear victims of the fighting and a testament to how rapidly people's everyday lives can be completely turned on their head. Just two days after this photo was taken, another image further to the southeast in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, captures the scene of a field full of artillery craters directly adjacent to a major residential area. Another before and after series of photographs taken only one day apart reveals the destruction of a TV and radio tower, the probable victim of a missile strike or an artillery shell. But of all of Ukraine's cities, none have been as overwhelmingly destroyed by the horrors of artillery and modern war as Mariupol. Mariupol had been a major target of the Russian invasion early on, as it was the largest city within the Donetsk Oblast they did not already control beforehand. But the city's heavy resistance against the invasion infuriated the Russian attackers, who began resorting more and more to indiscriminate and massive artillery strikes into the city to force it into submission, the aftermath of which can be clearly seen across satellite images. This photo was taken on the 21st of June, back in 2021, several months before the Russians invaded. It depicts a shopping mall on the left and a grocery store on the right in the western part of Mariupol before the war came to the city. And this photo was taken on the 9th of March in 2022, only a couple weeks into the invasion that already shows the destruction of the mall and grocery store from artillery bombardments. And no more cars to be seen in the parking lots or on the road. Normal life for hundreds of thousands here was over. As Russian airstrikes and artillery bombardments in Mariupol intensified across March, hundreds of civilians took shelter within this drama theater. This photo was captured on the 14th of March. With the theater still intact and the Russian word for children, Dieti, clearly visible written out in big letters on either side of it. A visible plea to the sky not to attack the building. Nonetheless, Two days after this photo was taken on the 16th, the theater was bombed by the Russian armed forces anyway. This photo taken days Oops. later on the 29th Yo. reveals the catastrophic damage the building suffered during the attack, with the word for children still clearly visible in the front. The Associated Press estimates that as many as 600 civilians within this theater died in this mm. one single attack, and it has consequently been widely labeled as a major war crime. Several months later, this photo was taken of the building again on the 30th of November. By then, Mariupol had been firmly beneath Russian military occupation for months. The site appears cleaned up, the words for children have been removed, and a large wall has been constructed around the entire theater's perimeter, covering up the damage and the crime from every possible angle except for the one where the bombs that did it came from. The air. But before the Russians completed their occupation of Mariupol, the city would burn and be largely reduced to ashes. Countless photos from satellites show the unbelievable extent and scale of the destruction that Mariupol has experienced. All Those of these photographs were taken across March. Those kids had nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this, man. April and May, as the Russians bombarded the city into oblivion and slowly moved in to capture the ruins. The United Nations would later conclude that at least 90% of the residential buildings in Mariupol had been damaged or completely destroyed during the siege and the fighting, while the Ukrainian authorities estimated that tens of thousands of civilians had lost their lives within it. This makes Mariupol the most heavily destroyed city in Europe since the Second World War, and puts it on a comparable scale to the devastation seen in Warsaw between 1939 and 1945. It's also important to remember that when looking through these photos that before the invasion, Mariupol was a major city home to around 450,000 people who lived ordinary lives just like you or me. This was another photo taken over Mariupol by a satellite on the 21st of June in 2021, several months before the invasion took place. It depicts a shopping mall and the banality of everyday life as normal, people driving to shop for clothes or pick up their groceries, completely unaware of the gears of history shifting against them. There is nothing particularly remarkable about this photograph at all, until you fast forward 10 months into the future and come back to the same location again in a 21st century city in Europe put to siege. Now, with the city largely in ruins and surrounded by enemy soldiers and supplies running out, the same everyday shopping mall appears like a scene from a movie after the apocalypse. But this is a real photograph taken in 2022. 
Lines of thousands of people can be clearly seen waiting outside for their chance at supplies. Hundreds of cars they came in choke the street adjacent to it, while the buildings nearby show extensive signs of damage from the war still raging all around them. There is perhaps no other contrast I have ever seen that so clearly illustrates how quickly everyday life can change for the worse for so many people. But across Mariupol doesn't- That's why I be saying, man, we be walking around all naive in our little bubble, like nothing can happen. And you can see in 2021, they were doing the same thing, just living their everyday normal lives. And then switch to 2022, and you can't even recognize the place. Eyes up, man, wise up. It's been my saying here recently, eyes up, wise up. Dozens of other before and after photos from above tell the same kind of story. This is yet another photo taken of residential apartments in Mariupol before the invasion, separated from a series of warehouses across from a busy street. And only a few months later after this photo was taken, the area is almost completely unrecognizable. It's still the same place, it's just been overwhelmingly destroyed. And there are no longer any signs of life to be seen. No more cars, no more trees, apartments all in ruin, just a wasteland. This is another neighborhood in Mariupol taken only months before the invasion in June of 2021. Life was normal for the hundreds of people who lived here, but fast forward to the end of March in 2022, oh and this is the scene you're left with over the same neighborhood. Nearly everything is destroyed, while a roadblock can be seen across the street here that's attempting to limit the direction of enemy vehicles. Eventually, by the end of May, surrounded by Russian forces and out of supplies, the Ukrainian defenders in Mariupol were left with little other choice but to surrender. To date, when this video was produced in February of 2023, Mariupol has remained under Russian military occupation for the past nine months, the evidence for which can be seen through these before and after satellite photographs that capture the sudden construction of a Russian army facility within Mariupol during the occupation. And while the Russians have been building new army bases in the occupied city, they've been demolishing damaged apartment buildings as well. This image was captured of a damaged apartment complex in Mariupol at the end of March when the battle for the city's control was still going on. And this image afterwards was taken in November, months into Russia's occupation, showing the total demolitions of at least seven of the apartment buildings in between that time. This next series of photographs shows a very similar series of events taking place. The first captured in March of damaged apartment buildings from Russia's massive artillery fire, and the second captured months later in November, with Let's most of the damaged apartment down. buildings completely demolished. The excavator still present, cleaning up all of the rubble and debris left behind. Besides for capturing countless destroyed buildings, satellites have captured other evidence for the human toll the war has caused as well. This is a before and after image taken only a week apart, captured above a graveyard just outside of Mariupol, clearly showing the digging of a mass gravesite. In another suburb of Mariupol, these series of images were captured only a couple weeks apart in the middle of the siege, capturing yet another significant expansion of a mass gravesite for the untold numbers of people in the city who were losing their lives. But Russia's casualties in the war were beginning to add up as well. This is an image captured in the middle of March over the airfield in Kherson, the regional capital of the Kherson Oblast that the Russians captured early on into the invasion. The photo reveals the occupied airfield bombarded by Ukrainian artillery, with scores of blown up and destroyed Russian military helicopters that had been waiting on the tarmac. Early on into the invasion, the Russians also captured the Ukrainian port of Berdyansk here on the Sea of Azov. On the 25th of March, this satellite photo reveals a Russian warship docked in the occupied port and partially submerged in the sea, the target of a Ukrainian missile strike from the day before. By early September, a little more than six months into the invasion, the Russian forces had likely already suffered nearly 100,000 casualties killed and wounded approximately half of the force they had yeah. used to initially invade Ukraine with. Unable to find enough volunteers to replace these battlefield losses, the Russian government announced a partial mobilization order and the conscription of 300,000 additional men to be sent to the front. Gripped with panic that- Imagine, imagine out of those 100,000, right? And we're just taking that number of the Russian soldiers, bro. Who probably didn't even want to be involved or doing this. Imagine that. And that's not to say that people don't take pride in standing up for their country, whether or not they agree with it. 
I'm just saying, just imagine that. The lives, bro. Like, I, out of all the arguments you try to proclaim and, and say and prove and understand and explain that this is history and this is what happens and we've been through it before and you name and you reference and you do different things, it's still a life loss. It's still a family who's losing a loved one out there. I bet if you ask them how they feel about it, they could care less about what it's going to mean for history. They give anything to have that loved one back. And that's the part of me that just, I just can't. I just cannot, man. I cannot. I'm pro-life, bro. I want everybody to, to come, always come home to their family. You ever been torn away or lose a loved one? I ain't no way to replace that. And I get, I get the other argument side of it that y'all are trying to make. I get that. They too could suddenly be served with draft papers and sent to the front line. An estimated 700,000 young Russian men chose to take fate into their own hands and fled the country within only the first. How many? It was like, this ain't, this ain't us, man. This ain't our fight and chose something different. And it ain't because they ain't got respect, so don't look at it like they ain't got respect for their country. But they be, may be looking at it like they got respect for those on the, on the other side or they ain't got nothing to do with this power struggle. This is crazy, man. This is crazy. And to see all of this, when you look at the news, sometimes you, you watch it a little bit and then you watch enough of it to where you can't stand and you walk away from it. So when you sit down and watch a video and it takes you from start to from from the past to the present of it, the beginning to where it is now. And seeing all of the carnage and all of the damage and destruction and everything all up in one 30 minute video, bro, is a lot. It's a lot. You sit back and you look at this and you just. It's just disgusting that all of this had to take place. Why? First two weeks after the mobilization order was announced, they loaded up into cars and escaped to whatever neighboring countries were still allowing them in, as captured in these series of satellite images over the border between Russia and Georgia near the end of September. Cars, trucks, and buses full of Russian men seeking to escape from the draft can be seen lined up in front of the border checkpoint into Georgia for dozens of kilometers. Around a and that's got to be one of the most nerve-wracking drives in your life. You ain't comfortable. You steady looking up, steady listening, hoping you out, you you in a safe zone. Quarter of a million Russians would enter Georgia in September of 2022 alone, all in a country with only around 3.7 million residents, meaning that the Russians escaping into Georgia in September alone represented around 7% of the entire Georgian population. Meanwhile, the situation on the ground in Ukraine for the hundreds of thousands of Russian men already there was growing worse and worse all the time. The Russians were struggling to adequately supply their forces on the southern front around Kherson because the Ukrainians managed to blow up a critical piece of Russian infrastructure right here, the Crimean Bridge across the Kerch Strait. You see, after the Russians invaded Ukraine for the first time back in 2014 and occupied and then annexed the Crimean Peninsula, there wasn't any road connecting Crimea over to the Russian mainland. More than 2 million people lived within Crimea, and that meant that the only ways to supply their position there was either by sending them overland through Ukraine, which Ukraine wasn't exactly in the mood to allow for some reason, or sending them in by ferry or by plane, which limited the numbers of supplies the Russians could get in. That's why, over a period of years, the Russians constructed the longest bridge in Europe across the Kerch Strait, the Crimean Bridge, a dual-use road and railway bridge that enabled Russian trucks and trains to directly transport supplies, equipment, and troops from the Russian mainland into Crimea without having to route through Ukraine. 
Obviously, after the Russian invasion of the rest of Ukraine in 2022, the bridge was being used to support the Russian front line just to the north of Crimea in the occupied section of the Kherson Oblast. That made the Ukrainians consider the bridge to be a valid military target. And on the 8th of October, a bomb went off that took out a section of the roadside of the bridge, captured in these satellite images taken only hours after the attack. The blast was powerful enough to send large sections of the roadside into the sea but only resulted in light damage for the rail side. This ended up meaning that train service across the bridge was able to quickly resume, but the heavy trucks carrying supplies to the front could no longer use it. That ended up leaving only two options for the Russian trucks to continue transporting supplies to the front line around Kherson, travel the long way through more than 200 kilometers of occupied Ukrainian territory and risk coming under attacks from partisans, or travel by ferry across the strait. But the problem with the ferries was that Russia simply didn't have enough of them in the Black Sea to meet the demand, resulting in trucks carrying supplies having to wait up to three or four days just for their chance to board one as seen in this satellite image taken only four days after the bridge was bombed, showing one of these ferries carrying Russian trucks laden with supplies across the strait towards Crimea. The consequences of this logistical bottleneck partially contributed to the collapse of the Russian front line in the south and the dramatic advances made by the southern Ukrainian counteroffensive, culminating with the Ukrainian liberation of Kherson on the 11th of November, the only regional capital of an oblast that the Russians had managed to capture since the beginning of their invasion. Since then, however, the ferocity of the war in other places, like in the Donetsk Oblast near the towns of Bakhmut and Solodar, has reached unprecedented levels unseen in Europe since the Second World War. This is an image captured over a field in the Donetsk Oblast in June of 2022. Hundreds of craters from artillery shells litter the field in a scene that appears reminiscent of the Western Front in France during the First World War. But this is Europe in 2022, not 1917, and it's far from the only example that looks like this. This is another field just outside of Bakhmut that was captured only a month before I produced this video in January of 2023. To the untrained eye, a scene like this may be confused with being the surface of the moon rather than a battlefield in modern That's a Europe. Fact. Over the past several months, Bakhmut and Solodar have become the epicenter of the war's fighting and the scenes of the heaviest combat seen in Europe since the two world wars, as evidenced by these next harrowing before and after scenes. This is a photo- How long do y'all think this can continue? I didn't even think it would make it this long. How long do y'all think this can continue? captured of a series of farm buildings in the rural town of Yakovlivka on the 1st of August, right before major combat operations in the area began. And then this is a photo taken over the exact same area just five months later in January of 2023, showing the complete devastation the fighting has brought to the whole area, with every one of the farm buildings in ruins. Nearby in the salt mining town of Solidar, this image was captured on the 1st of August in 2022 at the beginning of the battle over the city. Large apartment buildings and houses can still be seen almost totally intact, but fast forwarding only five months into the future to the 10th of January in 2023 reveals a truly apocalyptic level of destruction. Nearly everything from that first photo has been destroyed to a point of no longer even being recognizable as the same area with every apartment building, tree, and house in complete ruins, and hundreds of artillery craters left behind. And then, nearby to Solidar in the town of Bakhmut, another series of before and after photographs captured between August and January illustrates that town's annihilation as well. Another shocking testament to how human beings' everyday lives can be completely upended and destroyed in a matter of months because of the decisions made by a few. Had we had satellites over Europe during the Second World War, the images we would see of the conflict in our history lessons today would probably look almost identical to these ones. But perhaps the most harrowing thing of all that the satellites have captured over Ukraine these past 12 months has been what's been happening to the country's lights at night. Before the invasion, satellite maps over Europe looked pretty much like this, with Ukraine similarly lit up like the rest of the continent and the world. 
But then beginning in October of 2022, frustrated by their military defeats on the battlefield, the Russians began shifting to a strategy of deliberately bombing Ukrainian civilian energy infrastructure in order to deprive millions of Ukrainian civilians of critical electricity and heat, leading into the frigidly cold winter months. It is a cold strategy designed to try and crush Ukraine's morale on the home front in which the Russians have fired more than a thousand missiles or drones at Ukraine's infrastructure in only a couple of months. By the end of November, the results of these attacks had already destroyed around half of Ukraine's energy systems, and half of all the Ukrainian civilians still remaining in the country were left without electricity or heat. The results of these attacks, combined with more than 8 million people leaving the country altogether, has resulted in the almost complete darkening of Ukraine at night. The whole country That's now crazy. appears as a giant dark spot in the middle of Europe at night, as if it was something like North Korea. The borders that Ukraine shares with Russia, Moldova, Belarus, and the European Union dirty. can all clearly be dirty. seen right now from above at night, since all of those countries still have their lights on, while the Crimean Peninsula, still occupied by the Russians and thus not subjected to the withering Russian missile attacks, remains bright and lit up a symbol from above of Russia's territorial conquests and occupation. Only scattered lights across Ukraine remain in major cities like Kyiv, Odessa, and Lviv, while the countryside is nearly a total sea of darkness. Perhaps more than anything else, this contrast shows clearly how a country of more than 40 million people in Europe is being actively put to siege. I wish I could tell you- This is the, this is a serious chess game going on between them two, bro. Seriously. When you start doing things like that- And the war will be over and peace will return. But the honest truth is that nobody knows when that will happen. And I expect it unfortunately won't be for a long time more. All in all, the use of open source intelligence like satellite imagery has revealed key developments in the war in Ukraine. But it's also important to verify what you're actually seeing is really true. And today's sponsor, Ground News, is- That's the end of the video, man. I hope seeing this softens some of the hearts that were hardened and really didn't care or talk down or, or really had a lot of negative to say things to say about what was going on and, and wasn't mindful of the people and what they were going through. I hope this kind of softens your heart a little bit when you see that. Because when you see visuals like this, you can automatically start putting yourself in their shoes. It's inevitable. You, you automatically start doing it if you're somewhat of a good person. So seeing that, because I did it several times throughout, just imagining how or what it, what it would feel or how I would feel or what would I be doing, how devastated I would be, what I'd be thinking the entire time this video was going. This is rough, man. Prayers, prayers out to all of the families from both sides that are affected by this, man. Y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what you thought of this video, bro. Till next one, I'm gone. Peace.